Hello and a very warm welcome to the channel, to my new channel I should say. So this is my history specific reaction channel, I'm really excited to be doing this, I'm a complete history nerd, it's what I studied at university. Um, so this is, this is a safe space for those of us who want to talk about history and not get distracted with college football and NASCAR and all the other stuff <laughs> I do on my main channel. So I thought a really good place to start would be with an oversimplified video. So this is the First Punic War Part 1. Now, it's not, I, I don't know that much about the First Punic War. I, I know that there are three Punic Wars. I know far more about the second and the third than about the first. So the second one is the kind of the iconic one where Hannibal leads his army of, of elephants, or including elephants, across the Alps. They invade Italy, Battle of Cannae, a, a, a series of Roman defeats, but eventually the Romans win essentially by attacking the sorry, yeah, eventually the Romans win essentially by attacking the Carthaginians where Hannibal wasn't, um, which which worked quite well. The the third Punic War was basically Carthage just being destroyed. It, it, it was um, the, the, Ro the Romans bullying Carthage, forcing them into a war, and then absolutely sacking, ransacking the city. I mean, there, there was quite a lot of Carthaginian resistance. But the first Punic War, I actually don't know that much about, because I think that that was the point where both of them were still expanding powers. Both the Carthaginian Empire and the Roman Republic were expanding. And I, I believe the clash has started in Sicily, but I may be wrong. Um, anyway, we're, we're going to find out together, or you may know already. I'm going to find out. I'm not, so no, I'm very excited. Let's watch the video. This video was made possible. By NordVPN. Mm. Click the link below. And I should quickly warn you guys. Um, so this, the original video is twenty-seven minutes, and that's before you add my inane commentary on top. So <laughs> it's going to be a long one. Like, like you might not see your families again, and that's to be to be clear. That's a warning, not a threat. Um, but it might be a little while. Get an exclusive deal with a huge discount and a thirty-day money-back guarantee. Introducing Ooh. our new glorious. Breathtaking bucket play. <laughs> Limited quantity. Available now. Along with some Punic War character pins. Buy them. Or I'll marry your mother. <laughs> it's your choice. Wait, no, wait. Why do I have to choose one or the other? Why can't I have the character pins and have Mr. Oversimplify and marry my mother? Like, I, I, I'm not... It, it would be awkward in some ways. It, it would cause some family tensions. But uh, the conversations would be fantastic. I, I could get really into this history stuff. Uh, I mean, my dad, your dad, kind of knows some history, but Oversimplified would, would be a level above. Um, so yeah, if, if you watch Oversimplified, let, let me fix you up. <laughs> and I still want the character pins. Oh. So I, I got, um, I think C is, I think that's, I got 99 problems, but Rome ain't one. I'm not 100% I'm not sure what the C is. The X is the 10, and the one before the X is the 9. Marcellus! You sure have a lot of dignitas. Kiss me. Okay. Yes. <laughs> hey, Hi, son. Just reading the newspaper. What can I do for you? <laughs> well, you know how you always say Rome is the greatest civilization in the world? Yeah. <laughs> Bloody well is. Well, right. well, I was just wondering, what makes us so great? How did we come to be? Wow. My son. Boy. Let me take you on a journey. To this side of the room. <laughs> The story of Rome begins with these beautiful baby boys going to town on some she-wolf mommy milkers. That's gross. <laughs> You're gross! Uh, sorry, son. You're not gross. You've got to have a convincing origin story. That's what I love about the Romans. They kept it plausible. I love you. They're called Romulus and Remus. And when they grew up in 753 BC, they founded Rome. Hmm. But there was... So to be clear, this is obviously the, the, the mythological story of Rome's family. It's not actually historically accurate. Just one problem. They couldn't agree on which of them should be the king. Oh. But they worked it out peacefully, right? <laughs> oh, heavens <laughs> no. Romulus caved Remus's skull in with a shovel. Here's a picture. Our first king committed fratricide? I know. <laughs> Look at his face. <laughs> When's the part where we become the greatest civilization, Dad? <laughs> yeah. Well, you see, at first Rome was full of men. Oh, yeah. I'm talking like a Real and um, I, I was the model for, for not, not all of those guys, but at least two of them. Even though they're all the same. Don't ask me how that worked, that's what happened. Sausage party, you know what I mean? <laughs> yes, sir. So we invited some neighboring cities over for a big feast, and then we literally kidnapped all of their women. Here's a picture. Ha <laughs> ha! Look at that one! She's like, <laughs> This is messed up. You're yeah. messed up! Ugh. Ugh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'll be a better father. I promise. So then, finally, 
After centuries of monarchy, those tyrannical kings started getting a little too big for their britches. So we overthrew the kings and established Rome as a republic. Yeah. Is that when all the killing stopped? Oh, heavens no. That's when the killing surged, baby. We went wild and conquered the Latin. So it's worth mentioning that during the time of the Roman Republic, um, the kind of the, the old system, the, the, the kingdom, the king the system of kings was seen as being very barbaric and backward. And every time a Roman politician got too big for their boots, essentially, um, they, they would be accused of wanting to be a king. And that was about the grievous insult you could throw around in the Roman Republic. Obviously, in the end, they did go back to a sort of monarchy with the Roman Empire, but that's that, that's a fair bit in the future. The Samnites, the Etruscans, Woo! what a rush, Dad. Rome seems pretty barbaric. <laughs> You're barbaric! Oh, I forgot to tell you about the time a prophet told Saturn his son would one day overthrow him. So, so Saturn literally ate his own son seconds after he was born. I don't want to see a picture. Here's a picture. <laughs> Dad, look at that! That's messed up, man. Oh. I have to clear my browser issue after this. Jesus. Are we really this uncivilized? Hey, hey! If we were so uncivilized, would we use communal toilets where we all fart and poo together in one big stinky, steamy, dirty toilet room? <laughs> yeah. yeah, Dad, we would. Clean your butt with a sponge, Timulus. <laughs> but all these guys just used it. What's wrong with your son, bro? I don't want to be Roman. This is so weird. Yo! I, I love, okay, I've, I've paused it in the wrong moment. The newspaper's called The Times New Roman, which is pretty cool. Weird. Oh, sorry, you're not weird. I'm sure you're probably fine. <laughs> First Punic War. The Roman Republic, a nation that, since its foundation, had been stabbing necks all the way down the Italian peninsula. Yeah. But this isn't the famous Roman Empire that ruled the known world. Not yet anyway. This is a relatively juvenile Rome, still just a regional power. In 264 BC, the big daddy of the Western Mediterranean was Carthage. Mm. Let's rewind a bit. Carthage was founded in 814 BC when some Phoenicians in Tyre had a mega surplus of goods and decided to export those goods across the Mediterranean. They became the dominant trading power in the region and to support their growing trade network, the Phoenicians established a number of colonies, one of which was Carthage. I've always found it interesting how quite a few relatively minor powers became very influential in the Mediterranean, and particularly controlled Mediterranean trade routes. So, I mean, obviously the Phoenicians managed it. I mean, Carthage was a, a Phoenician colony that became independent. Also, I mean, later on, of course, I mean, Athens kind of managed it. I mean, you, you could say the Greeks in general, but if you want to have a specific state, Athens came closest. Then further on still, the, the Venetian Republic and Genoa in particular, the, um, the Italian states did really well. So the, these are actually very small powers that have massive um, influence over the Mediterranean. Carthage. Therefore, Carthage began its life as a Phoenician trade colony, and the Carthaginians were actually Phoenicians. Or, if you're a Latin-speaking Roman, they were Punic. Hence the name of the video. Ah. Over the centuries, Carthage gradually expanded and became the region's base of power. Just like Rome, Carthage was a semi-democratic republic with its own senate and judiciary. But there were also some pretty hefty differences between the two. While Rome was big into farming and stabbing people in the neck, the Carthaginians, on the other hand, just like their Phoenician forefathers, had built their power through trade and navigating the waves. They went here and there, selling ivory tusks, gold, well, all the way and to, slaves. All the way to and as a result, they were rolling in it. Whenever they weren't busy swimming around in their copious hordes of money, in their spare time, they also possibly enjoyed sacrificing their children to Baal, the yeah. god of... Let me just check my notes. Ah, yes. Plant fertility. Oh boy, these pigs are... <laughs> so, it, this is really interesting, the, the whole Carthaginian human sacrifice thing. Um, for a very long time, I mean, the, the Romans always said that the Carthaginians practiced human sacrifice. For a very long time, historians didn't totally believe them. They thought this was probably Roman propaganda. Um, but more recent evidence suggests that, actually, yeah, the Carthaginians did do human sacrifice. So, you know, that perhaps makes what happens to them later a bit more understandable. Aren't looking too hot. Maybe if I throw my son into a burning pit of fire, he'll <laughs> yeah. grow. Have you tried watering them, Dad? Hmm. That's boring. No, we'll try that second. As a result <laughs> of all their trading, Carthage had emerged as one of the Mediterranean's superpowers. Mm. But wait, they said. Rome? What the heck is that? Well, I know it's a pretty obscure little country that you've probably never heard of. <laughs> yeah. But this spunky young nation was about to upset the entire region's balance of power. 
Initially, the two sides enjoyed relatively friendly relations <laughs> and had even signed well, a couple yeah. treaties. But it was a relationship that was practically destined to turn sour. See, Rome had a thing where they liked to aggressively expand their boundaries, often viewing such expansion as a defensive act, kind of like when you had to kill your neighbor because you knew eventually they would have tried to kill you first. Yeah. Meanwhile, it's, it's crazy just how many world leaders or how many civilizations face their um, betray their own aggression as, as defensive. I mean, the British Empire did it all the time. I mean, in the modern world, Putin is, is pretty renowned for this. Carthage was extremely protective of its wealthy trade network. So if you put a very strategically important island between them, well, two plus two <laughs> equals war. Tensions rose, and the two sides began viewing each other with increasing disdain. The hard-working Romans looked across the water at the money-hungry Carthaginians and said, Look at those dishonest crooks. Bet they've never done an honest day's work in their lives. And the Carthaginians looked back and said, Look at those simple-minded brutes. Bet they've never sacrificed a baby <laughs> in their lives. Yeah! While war between the two superpowers seemed inevitable, the event that finally triggered it was a little unexpected. The whole thing began with a few simple mad lads on a wild night out. These mad lads are called the Mamertines. They were Italian mercenaries employed by the tyrant of Syracuse. Here. But when he died, his successor said, Sorry fellas, we don't need any big burly men with sharp sticks anymore. You can all go home. <laughs> the Mamertines, as it turned out, didn't want to go home. So instead, they went to the nearby town of Messana and said, Hey man. We are but poor little buff boys without a home. <laughs> yeah. May we come in? Aw, poor fellas. I think, I, I'm trying to remember, I think Syracuse was primarily a Greek civilization or, or, or state. I, I might be not totally sure about that. Um, after, after going check, I, I, I've aroused my curiosity. And that's the only thing I've aroused, to be clear. Sure thing. <laughs> uh -uh. Just so long as you promise not to massacre all of us. <laughs> 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 we promise. The Mamertines yeah. had massacred all of them. Well, not all of them, just the men. And they stole their homes and families. Ha! This is my house now. This is my best dad ever mug now. <laughs> and you guys are my new family. How can he have a best dad ever mug? Because I got my dad a best ma um, dad ever mug. And there can't be two of them because that would be a lie. So now I'm really confused. Son, wanna go play catch with your old papa? <laughs> You're not my real dad! Ugh. Teenagers, am I right, dear? You're not my real husband. <laughs> Ugh, I'm so trapped in this marriage. <laughs> then get out! Go fishing! No, Messana was now controlled by the Mamertines, and they began raiding up and down the Syracuse coastline. When the new ruler of Syracuse saw this, he wasn't happy. The Syracusans began fighting back, and in response, the Mamertines said, Oh crap, they're fighting back? What do we do? Quick! We'll convince the Carthaginians to come and save us. No, oh, no! We're in trouble. <laughs> and we need a big, strong empire to come and rub our bellies. Why are you saying it like that? If I was a big, strong empire, I think I'd like to be seduced. <laughs> See? It's working! The Carthaginians had long dreamed of controlling all of Sicily. They had been fighting Syracuse and their Greek influence on the island for centuries. And now, yeah, they, yeah, they were Greek. I, I thought they were. Here was a great opportunity to get one over on them. So Carthage promptly answered the Mamertines' cry for help and sent a force to garrison Messana. Yeah. As it turned out, however, some within the ranks of the Mamertines weren't too happy with the occupying Carthaginians. And they sent out a second cry for help to Rome. When it reached the Roman Senate, they... These guys love crying for help. ...were a little more hesitant. Going to help the Mamertines ran the risk of triggering an all-out war with Carthage, and they had only just finished conquering the Italian peninsula, so they were kind of tired. Plus, the Mamertines were all the way across the water. They had never made a leap like that before. So you would assume that to avoid any conflict with Carthage, the exhausted Romans would probably sit this one out. But you would assume wrong. Yeah. Rome just couldn't resist a good chance for war. Why? Well... There's something you gotta understand about Rome. See, as a republic, they were hellbent on preventing any one man from ever gaining too much power. And so rather than having one leader, Rome had two, called consuls, who shared power. These consuls could also only serve for one year at a time before new consuls were elected. These measures to limit the powers of the consuls were noble, but had an interesting side effect. 
the consuls knew they had just one year to try and gain as much glory and prestige as possible, something that was very important in Roman society. And the best way of gaining glory and prestige, military victory. So this is a really interesting point. It's, there's been so much debate about why the Roman Republic was as aggressive as it was um, compared to other states. I mean, this, this probably is the most convincing explanation. I mean, other than the fact that they were very good at war, but what, why they were specifically so aggressive was because um, it, it, essentially political success in the Roman Republic was intricately linked with, with military glory. Uh, and, and to get to get popular support, you needed military victories. That's, they, they, the two went hand in hand. So it, it made a huge incentive for, for Roman politicians, Roman generals, to become um, militarily aggressive. Of course, the Roman political system basically ended up encouraging these consuls to go out and be as aggressive as your Italian grandmother when you don't exactly. eat all the spaghetti. <laughs> and so the glory-seeking consuls convinced the people to vote in favor of going to Messana. Uh. And in, they went. Upon the arrival of the Romans, the Carthaginians in the city, amongst the confusion, were forced to leave. Now, in contrast to Roman aggression, the Carthaginian military had a slightly different philosophy. All right, kids, listen up. <laughs> if you want to grow up to be Carthaginian military leaders, there's a few things you have to understand. If you fail to succeed on the battlefield, that's a crucifixion. Showing cowardice, that's a crucifixion. Hello, sir. But what are you doing here? Aren't you meant to be in Messana? Yeah, but the Romans showed up. So you just left? Sure did. Oh, you better believe that's a crucifixion. Well, what the interesting thing about the Carthaginians is they were very heavily reliant on mercenaries by comparison to... Um, the, I mean, the Roman Republic used mercenaries a lot as well, but by comparison to Rome. I mean, one of Carthage's biggest wars, in fact, one of the biggest threats to Carthage in its history, other than the, the Punic Wars, was what was called the Mercenary War, which basically was, was when like, the, they, the Carthaginians hired a very large number of mercenaries who later rebelled. Uh, and they, they did eventually manage to suppress the rebellion. But it, it, it's a, you can see there's two very different political and military systems about to collide. The Roman consuls were awarded for victory and therefore tended to be aggressive go-getters. By contrast, the Carthaginian generals were brutally punished for failure, and so they tended to be more cautious and restrained. Yeah. This dynamic is helpful for understanding some of the crazy things that happened during the Punic Wars. That's definitely true. So, the Romans have crossed over to Messana, and now there was some red on the island. <laughs> Hit that panic button. <laughs> this turn of events was unacceptable to both Carthage and Syracuse, so the traditional enemies teamed up to kick the Romans off their island. They surrounded the city and said, Hey, you jerks, this isn't your <laughs> island. Come out of there at once. Okay, we're coming. See, Phil, you just got to speak <laughs> with authority. That's what being an alpha male is all about. Hey, man. Uh, oh, you, you brought your weapons and armor? No, I, I didn't mean... Oh, crap. You've got to be more specific, mate. The Roman legions came to engage the Carthaginians in battle, and they sent them packing. With the Battle of Messana, whether intended or not, by going to help the Mamertines, the two sides had just slipped into an all-out war. With the initial Roman victory, towns across Sicily, including Syracuse, began switching allegiance. Because being a winner is more fun. But the Carthaginians weren't about to just give up that easily. In 262 BC, they began building up their forces at Agrigentum. So the Romans, being aggressive go-getters, aggressively go-got them. The Romans immediately laid siege, hoping to starve out the Carthaginian garrison. However, because this was the first time Rome had been fighting outside the Italian peninsula, across the water, they struggled to supply their forces. Ah. And so this is going to become a, a continuous issue for the Romans in the First Punic War, um, was they had very little, I mean, as indeed the, the honor age has already said, they had very little naval power. And one of the kind of big miracles of the First Punic War is that the Romans actually did manage to build a, a powerful navy and kind of fight the Carthaginians at what the Carthaginians were best at. And before long, the Romans were as starving as the Carthaginians they were besieging. They had to forage for food, leaving them open to ambush. And when Carthaginian reinforcements arrived, creating a double siege, things got and th this of course well um reminds me of one of julius caesar's, julius caesar's famous battle against the gauls where he was besieging a a, a gaulic encampment um and another gaulic army 
turned up and besieged him. It is sort of a weird double siege. And, and he, he won that. So. I'm really bad. Everybody starved each other for months until nobody could take it anymore. <laughs> and they all finally came out for battle, which Rome won. Ooh. Here's the report from the recent siege at Aggregentum, sir. We killed 30,000 while only suffering 7,000 losses? That's amazing! We're the best! <laughs> yes, sir. Oops, those are the wrong <laughs> What? We lost 30,000? So that, 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 that's like a definition of a period victory. The worst! But we won, right? Yes, sir. But we also got our asses kicked. Yes, sir. <laughs> so are we the best or the worst? Yes, sir. Both. <laughs> the Romans won at Aggregentum because they were aggressive go-getters, and they now began eyeing up the possibility of conquering the entire island. But they also suffered very heavy losses, and it was clear they couldn't sustain a campaign if they couldn't supply their troops. Here's the issue. Sicily was an island. Islands are surrounded by water. Yeah. A strong navy would be vital for supplying troops and winning the war. Here was Carthage's navy. And here was Rome's. <laughs> I think you can see the problem. Yeah. Historians debate just how much naval experience Rome had at this point. Presumably, they must have had something to defend their shoreline. But whatever it was, it would have paled in comparison to the Carthaginian juggernaut. So what's the interesting? The, the way they're, um, they're showing the Carthaginian navy here on Oversimplified, they're basically kind of Greek-style triremes. I don't know if that's actually what they had. I mean, it, it, it may well have been. I don't know. If, if you do know, please comment below. I'll be really interested. And so Rome had to figure out exactly what to do about all this water. Come on, men. We're not going to let some pansy candy-ass water get in the way of our <laughs> glorious victory against Carthage. Charge! <laughs> Tell my kids, I love We're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> What's a boat? I don't know. <laughs> if the Romans wanted to win this war and obtain Sicily, there was only one thing for them to do. I guess we're just going to have to go ahead and build ourselves a war fleet, aren't we? From scratch? From scratch. But we don't even know how. Never mind how to fight with one. Don't worry, Hank. We're up to the challenge. Come on, guys. We're Romans. And Romans aren't afraid of anything! <laughs> and so, the Romans worked long and hard trying to figure out how on earth you actually build the latest style of warship. Can you imagine if they got the... I, I, obviously, I know, I know it's not real, but can, can you imagine if that actually works? Like, having like a... Maybe not a fit, like a whale on that, like that, putting like a giant car across the water. In the end, they kind of want to try it, which I know is really evil of me. Had a bit of luck on their side. A Carthaginian Quinquirin ended up accidentally oh. grounding on Italian soil. The Romans found it and copied the design. While the new fleet was being built, the Romans trained rowers on land. And would you believe it? The Romans put together a full fighting fleet of 120 warships in Ooh. just two months. That's, that's, that's staggering wow. feat. That's, that's insane. Now, I know what you're thinking, but oversimplified. If the Romans can build a war fleet from scratch in two months, then why does it take you half a year <laughs> to make a video? Yeah. Well, my valued subscribe. As as an even more lazy YouTube creative and oversimplified, considering how much less work I have to do, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to get into this argument. I think you should shut up. <laughs> what the heck? How on earth did the Romans learn how to build a war fleet? This shouldn't be happening. From what I hear, they copied the design from us, sir. Well, how on earth did they get the blueprint? Carl? <laughs> I, I don't know, sir. But I'll tell you what. If you're worried about people stealing your data, ah, no, and you want to protect I yourself from outside going. threats, don't you dare. <laughs> then you, my friend, if you mention NordVPN, I'll scream. Should use NordVPN. I didn't know it was going to be NordVPN, but I knew it was going to be a VPN. Out you, And then selling your data to advertisers who convince you to buy things you don't need in an endless cycle over and over until you... Yeah, I like those... Um, what was it like? The, the, the Punic War figurines I've um, sold, I've married off my mother to so simplified for. Protect your online data from undesirable eyes. That means you can look at all the squatty potties you want. <laughs> no one will know. With NordVPN, you can search for better online deals and other... I mean, when you say it that way, it becomes pretty irresistible, doesn't it? Country. 
NordVPN now comes with a threat protection function and much more. And if you don't like it, it comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Go to nordvpn.com slash oversimplified to get an exclusive deal with a huge discount. That's nordvpn.com slash oversimplified. And as always, you'll be supporting my channel. Go so do that. Go now, support the channel. We? Oh, yeah. The Seajet Aggregentum, supply issues, and building a war fleet. Ooh. So now the Romans have a navy. And it's time to put it to the test. But how does one wage ancient naval warfare? Easy. All of the ships had giant bronze rams on the front. Mm. So all you had to so do... So that's exactly the style of Trireme. Um, Same so as you try, you, you hit them with a the ram, try and, um, if possible, punch a hole inside, or um, otherwise disrupt it. I mean, there was some boarding action as well. Was outmaneuver the enemy and give him the jimmies. Easy as pie. And so the aggressive Romans set out for some good old-fashioned jimmy giving. The consul, Gnaeus Cornelius Scipio, set out for the town of Lipara, believing... So interestingly, yeah, the, the guy that actually conquered Carthage in the Third Punic War was called Scipio. I'm assuming it's not the same guy, considering that this must be quite a long... A lot, I think it's quite a lot of time earlier. Um, but I don't know if he's going to be like his... if they're related or something. Again, I'd be, I'd be really interested to know. Um, please, if, if, if you know, please do comment in the description. The garrison there. Not the description. <laughs> Comment in the comments. Only I can put stuff in the description. Wanted to join the Romans. As he entered the harbour, however, he found himself trapped by a Carthaginian fleet. And in the following skirmish, he was completely outmatched. Ooh. The Romans may have had a brand new fleet, but when it came to engaging in actual combat, their inexperience showed. There was just something better about the Carthaginian ships. The Carthaginian rowers had nicer abs. <laughs> the entire Carthaginian empire had been built on expert seamanship. So, when it came to water, the Carthaginians were better, and the Romans were wetter. <laughs> In their initial skirmish, the Romans were beaten so badly that the consul, Scipio, was given a nickname, Asina. And if you're wondering what that means, just drop the Ina. <laughs> so what were the Romans to do? How could they possibly stand up to this Carthaginian superpower? Well, there's something you gotta understand about the Romans. Back when they found that Carthaginian ship and copied its design, that wasn't a one-off thing. Copying their enemies was as Roman as punishing murderers by sewing them into a leather pouch with a monkey, snake, and rooster, and then throwing them into a river, which is a thing they did. They did that? Wait, what was I talking about? <laughs> oh yeah, copying their enemies. Look, I thought I was tough on law and order. Many of the most famous Roman inventions were actually borrowed. That's very Aqueducts, true. Aqueducts, chariot racing, their gods. Even in warfare, the Romans would get pierced by a Sabine javelin, and they'd be like, Wow, they'd get hacked to bits by an... So the, the, the Sabine Javelin was designed, um, or the intention behind it was it, it's very, very thin before the point, so it would bend on impacts, and it basically meant you couldn't then throw it back, and it, and it would get stuck in your shield if you had a shield. Tiberian sword, and they'd be like, wow! <laughs> and they'd copy the designs for themselves. However, they wouldn't just copy it, they would advance it, finding ways to adapt it as perfectly as Ooh. possible. And in the case of naval warfare, the Romans realized if they wanted to beat the Carthaginians at their own game, they would have to adapt. The Romans excelled at combat on land, not on water. But what if, they said, we could somehow turn a sea battle into a land battle? Ah, I, 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 I crazy, see what this guy. Right? Well, they made a couple of tweaks to their warship, and look, here they come again. They must love getting their asses kicked. <laughs> uh, sir? What's that tall thing sticking out of their ships? <laughs> they really are idiots! Look at that thing! That'll make them blow over! I mean, look at... <laughs> Bob! <laughs> Traditional Carthaginian <laughs> name. Take a picture of it! <laughs> I mean, how stupid can you be? Let's just add a big wooden tower to our ship that'll weigh us down and blow us over in the wind! <laughs> I mean, what does that thing even do? <laughs> the Romans had built a big swinging spiked gangway called the Corvus. So when the Carthaginian ships approached to ram them, the Romans would just slam them. 
That's really interesting. That's really smart. The Carthaginians tried going around. No problem. You can the swing Corvus it. could swivel. Try going behind. The Romans would huddle to the coastline. It was foolproof. <laughs> Those big, sexy Carthaginian rowing muscles could flex all they want, but they were no match for the Roman mind. Uh. So, ladies, you see, what really matters <laughs> is what's on the inside. <laughs> Please go out with me. I'm going to add that to my dating profile. And with that, the Romans. Sure, it'll make a massive difference. Who had only just recently began dabbling in the art of naval combat. Thanks to their ingenious Corvus, Ooh. had just managed to outclass the Mediterranean seafaring superpower. The Carthaginians were stunned. And the general in charge of the defeated Carthaginian fleet. I, I think fleet. I know what's going to happen here. Well, you better believe that's a crucifixion. <laughs> With their newfound control of the seas, the Romans could now more easily blockade coastal cities and supply their legions on land. Surely, the Romans were now free to unleash their aggression <laughs> all over the island. Haha! <laughs> hey Carthaginians, what are you gonna do now that we're free to rampage across the island? We're gonna go inside these walls and close this gate. <laughs> oh, come on guys, stop messing around. Come out so we can kill you. No. Nope. Oh, come on. No. Ow, no! To counter the new Roman supremacy, the Carthaginians decided to engage in a defensive war of attrition, forcing the Romans to engage in siege. After lengthy siege, the war in Sicily became a long, hard, back and forth slug. One by one, cities slowly fell as the Romans gained ground. Occasionally, the Carthaginians countered and even pushed them back, only for the Romans to rebound again. And whenever a city did finally fall, the Romans could delight in slaughtering the entire population and selling any survivors into slavery, which yeah. was pretty standard procedure at the time. In general, the campaign on land was progressing much slower than the Romans had hoped, and quite frankly, they were getting... Oh, you see, the, the irony is, um, obviously, we, we think of the Roman Republic as being, and, and indeed to some extent the Roman Empire, as being the height of civilization in their era, which is kind of true, but even by... By modern standards, they were horrendous. I'm sick of it. So in 256 BC, they decided that something had to change. Hey everyone, my name's Marcus Attilius Regulus, and I'll be one of your consuls for this year. Look, as I'm sure you all know, Sicily's being a bit of a drag. Sure, I could go and spend my entire year as consul besieging one single city, but they'll never make a naked statue of me for that. <laughs> so here's the new plan. I'm gonna skip Sicily entirely. Take my army and go right for the heart of Carthage itself. Ah. I'll slaughter the men, enslave all the women and children, and when I return, you'll all build a thousand <laughs> naked statues of me. Uh, Marcus, that women and children stuff, that seems pretty evil yeah. and barbaric. No, Jim, it's perfectly normal in the ancient world. Okay. Sometimes we even chop their pets in half. <laughs> okay, guys. Looks like the Romans are coming straight for us this time. And what will they do when they get here? They'll kill us all. They'll massacre each and every last one of us. They may even chop our pets in half. <laughs> That's barbaric! No, Robins, we're right. actually pretty normal for the time. Mm, okay. We do the same to them. <laughs> Who will protect us? Funny you should ask, Mary. That's kind of why I called this meeting. Who will protect us? Protect our families. Our homes. Our children. I volunteer. It's getting too emotional. I'm Spartacus. You guys? Ha! Don't make me laugh. Why, you're just a bunch of stupid and weak farmers. Simple-minded buffoons. Cowards. Fools. I regret saying I was going to fight for this guy. Rob here thinks enslaving women and children is barbaric. <laughs> you're a snowflake, Rob. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> The fact is, if the Romans manage to land on African soil, we're all gonna die. A terrifying, hideous, unspeakably painful death. So inspiring. Is that the end of that speech? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the Carthaginians had to stop the Romans from ever landing in Africa. Because they believed that would be the end. 
So as the Romans were building an invasion fleet, the size of which the world had never seen before, the Carthaginians were preparing an even bigger one to stop them. And in 256 BC, as the Roman invasion fleet made its way south, the stage was set for a humongous battle that saw 680 warships, around 300,000 men, fighting to decide the course of the war. So one of the things, assuming these numbers are accurate, and I'm, I'm always a little bit skeptical on numbers for ancient battles, particularly if they're based on source material because they, they always exaggerated like mad. But it's kind of interesting how the sort of numbers that were fielded by armies in, in the ancient world or by the, the main powers of the ancient world weren't really matched again until kind of the end of the right, the end, very end of the Middle Ages. Um, so 150,000 against 140,000. I mean, I mean, like take a, a famous medieval battle or Agincourt, for example. I mean, I, I, again, we don't know the exact numbers, but I mean, 7,000 against 30,000, maybe. Um, I mean, the, the numbers are just crazy. Or to this day, the Battle of Cape Egnomus remains possibly the largest naval battle <laughs> in human history, all the way back. That, that's kind of why I'm a little bit skeptical about the numbers, um, because it just doesn't seem plausible. But you know, I'm, I'm not an expert on the era, so perhaps, perhaps it was. In ancient times. So the next time your granddad tells you about the time he sank a Japanese aircraft carrier, <laughs> kick him in the nuts. The Romans <laughs> had a lot riding on this battle. They weren't just sending their warships, but transports as well. Full of supplies and horses for their invasion of Africa, they therefore formed a protective wedge-like formation to punch through the long, thin Carthaginian line. The Carthaginian generals, however, desperate to prevent the Romans from reaching Africa, had a plan of their own. As the Roman fleet approached, the Carthaginian center feigned a retreat, luring the Romans in so their outstretched flanks could envelop them and get around the Roman corvus. Oh, the tower transports. But... With such a huge battle and so many ships crowded together, the Carthaginians struggled to maneuver as hoped. <laughs> and in the chaos, three separate battles emerged across the huge battle space. With the number of ships limiting their ability to maneuver, the Carthaginians became sitting ducks, and all the Romans had to do was start swinging. <laughs> the Romans. It's interesting that the Carthaginian, the Carthaginians didn't, by the sound of things, um, mimic the Romans and also use these kind of boarding ramps. Or perhaps they just wanted to avoid boarding altogether if they weren't very good at um, that type of fight. Center came out on top and were then able to turn around and rescue their pinned down flanks. The Battle of Cape Egnomus was a Roman Oof. victory. Well, that is, um, I say, I, I'm learning a lot of new stuff. I'm, this is not an era, an era I know very much about, so that was really interesting. I'm very excited for part two. I say this is a new channel, but if you haven't already, please do subscribe. Um, please hit a like, I know, I think that's really useful. And I really hope to see you again. Thank you very much.